So we'll get started with the first talk. So the MPFL gets a lot of attention, and there's a lot of good reasons for it to get that much attention. So there's only so many things that move the sesamoid bone that is the patella, and it's the pull of the quadriceps where it attaches proximally, and then obviously as it comes distally to the patella itself. And then the MPFL, which is a check rein that helps guide the patella before it gets into the trochlear groove. And then the tibial tubercle. And really the tibial tubercle angle is what determines where the patella tracks relative to the quadriceps. So that's why we focus also so much on our tibial tubercle osteotomies, because that's really what controls the angle or the actual cue angle of the quad. The MPFL acts within the first 20 to 30 degrees of flexion, depending on the amount of alta that the patient has. So assuming that the patella is not sitting high, most of its force is enacted during those first few degrees of flexion, and after that it really should become irrelevant, especially if the patient has otherwise normal anatomy. And again, that's why it's one of our main focuses. So if we look at this on an x-ray and really see what is happening as we rotate this, we look at the trochlear groove itself and how much overlap there is with the patella in full extension with a patient with no alta, so their height is normal. You can see that there's not a lot of overlap, maybe 50 to 25 percent of the patella with the trochlea. The trochlea is not particularly deep in that area, so it really doesn't have much of an effect. As the knee flexes down and we get down to almost 40 degrees of flexion here, you can see that it's almost full engagement of the patella. And the only reason that would not be the case is if that patient has trochlear dysplasia and there's nothing to engage with, or they have a lot of patellar uh, alta where it's sitting high and then obviously it's not going to be as far down. But as soon as it starts to engage by 20 to 30 degrees, that's really when it should center and feel the bony constraints. That's also an important point for the technique, which we'll talk about later, as far as trying to figure out where to set length. It's hard to know when it's in full extension because there's so much medial to lateral translation, but as you get it to engage, you know exactly where it's going to sit based on the groove in the tibial tubercle, as much as you can tell with the patient asleep. This is something that I think is a, a good analogy and to talk not just about the medial side, but also the lateral side. So the lateral retinaculum was always viewed as a burden, never something that could be beneficial. And if it was ever tight over there, we would just release it. I think that we're getting better at moving away from that, and uh, certainly that really should be the case. So you can imagine if these two are balancing each other out, so the red one's the MPFL, the yellow one is the LPFL or the lateral retinaculum. If your patella is tracking laterally and that side is too tight, and your response is to release the LPFL or to release the lateral retinaculum, you have no control over that side anymore. And so you can easily over-constrain it or over-pull medially and actually get iatrogenic medial instability. So we kind of asked the patellofemoral study group, have you ever seen non-iatrogenic medial instability? And none of them have ever run across it, and uh, I have not either. But iatrogenic medial instability is real. And so the analogy is if you were steering a horse and the horse was pulling too far to the right and you wanted to center it, you wouldn't just let go of the rein on the right side because then you're never going to get straight again. You certainly won't go right, but you're not going to go straight. And so that's why what really we should be doing if you're concerned about this is doing a lateral lengthening where you take that lateral side and you actually lengthen the soft tissue to rebalance it and set that length. The other thing to keep in mind is that these vectors, I'm sorry, go back there for a second. These vectors are really more of an A to P distance than they are medial to lateral. So you're really holding the patella into the trochlea and keeping it that way as opposed to two things coming from side to side and pulling. And so we're always setting length, we're not setting tension, um, and that's a really important distinguishing factor. Looking at the actual anatomy of the ligament, uh, we know more now from Tanaka's data and others, as well as Fulkerson, that as it comes up proximally, half of it inserts on the quad tendon, most of it's deep. Uh, and then here you can see it distally going into the patella, about 50% down the patella. There's the superior border of the patella, so again, half of the MPFL is actually proximal to the proximal pole of the patella. So there's a large dynamic component that attaches to the soft tissues proximal to the patella itself. So for that reason, there's uh, re interest in MQTFL, which is actually reconstructing the MPFL to the quad tendon. And part of this is also to avoid uh, the risks that are associated with putting holes in the patella, which we'll talk about later. When we look at the anatomy arthroscopically on the bottom right, that's a normal MPFL in a patient that's undergoing an ACL reconstruction. So you can see how it really is a thickening and relatively well-defined band that's a fan-shaped structure 
that extends again more wide uh, at the patella and it narrows down towards the femur and that's a reconstruction just above that and that's really what we're trying to recreate and that's why that double limb is probably the best way to do it although there's a lot of techniques and a lot of ways to get it right. That being said, the technique is very important because you can end up with a lot of issues with regarding to stiffness if you get it wrong. And we're talking about differences of five millimeters, so that's not really a large distance, especially if you're drilling a hole that's eight millimeters, and you put that graft at the front of the back of that hole, that's a several millimeter difference uh, from the center of the graft, so even, even that small variation can have an effect. And so we really want to make sure that we're as accurate as possible. We also do not want to put any tension on the graft. So the more tension that you put on when you set it, the more likely you are to increase contact pressures of the patellofemoral joint and lead to early arthritis. So really no tension should be placed on the graft whatsoever. And most of them should probably have their length set at about 20 degrees of flexion if they're engaging in the trochlea at that time. And we'll talk more about that technique later this afternoon. Shuttle has probably the most popular data on how to determine where to put this, and it's based on using anatomy, radiographic markers, and determining a point cloud to see where most of the time the MPFL is, and it sits between the medial, uh, medial epicondyle and the adductor tubercle. You can see that using uh, the posterior femoral cortex and a line perpendicular through this at the bottom of the notch, it's just, just anterior and posterior, I'm sorry, anterior to that line and proximal to the other line. And I'll show you why that really matters. So if you take this, that's a line connecting the shuttle's point to the anterior aspect of the trochlea, which is where it would engage again in about 20 degrees of flexion. If we rotate that line without changing its length, you can see how the relative length to the condyle is much longer. That means the ligament will become relatively lax. And so because of that, it does not act in flexion, which is correct, and there should be no concern with starting early range of motion in these patients because it shouldn't be tightening in flexion anyhow. This is an example of a patient that I saw uh, that had several surgeries, and this is where their MPFL was placed. And you can imagine that as this knee flexes down, as we rotate that line without changing its length, it has to get significantly tighter. That's why these patients lose flexion. If that graft doesn't lengthen and stretch over time, then they end up with arthrofibrosis, and that's what he had, and he had a, a flexion contracture. So looking at outcomes, why don't we just put these in everybody then if, if we really know how to do it and we feel like we've gotten to a stage that uh, we have the anatomy figured out. Well, there's still a fairly high complication rate, and that can be the stiffness that we've talked about or fractures associated with this procedure. So there's a fracture on the left of the patella, and on the right that uh, was actually placed uh, here originally, and then the tunnel expanded to try to get down because you can see how that line is going to be way off, and as it comes over here, it's starting to balance out a little bit more. And so what, how does this really compare in outcomes when you're talking about first-time dislocators compared to reefing or just performing a repair of the medial tissues? So all these studies I'm going to go through now are level one studies. They're all randomized clinical trials. And they, just note how they all have different outcomes that they look at. And so that's another important point is that we need to standardize that. But here, looking at non-operative treatment of a first-time dislocator compared to reefing for a first-time dislocation, the Kujala score was the same with surgery and without, so we didn't make that any better. The recurrence rate went down significantly, but it's amazing how that doesn't affect the patient's subjective outcome scores. And the return to sport was marginally improved, and the overall level of activity really didn't change at all based on the Tegner activity score. So we're stopping them from re-dislocating, but we're not making them get back to where we want them to be, and we're not making all the subjective improvements that we want. It sounds exactly like the story of the ACL, and that's really where we're getting to now, is that we need to figure out why we still have the kinesiophobia component and uh, what, what's really stopping us, because it's not necessarily the structural aspects. Looking at non-operative uh, treatment for first-time dislocators compared to a repair, uh, similar Kujala again, decreased recurrence rate, similar story. This may say repair is not as good an imbrication, but technically uh, it's hard to know exactly what people are doing there. Those have a lot of overlap. Similar one here, Kujala is the same, you get the idea. But then if we go over to look at an acute reconstruction, so this is a first-time dislocator that has a turn-down form of an MPFL that Kujala was significantly better in this setting, so maybe we're getting a little bit better than doing the repair of the reefing. The recurrence rate was also much better, but they didn't look at specifics of return to sport. Finally, looking at a pediatric population, uh, doing a Rue Goldthwaite, similar decreased recurrence, but not adequate reporting on really how the patients are doing otherwise. 
And this is uh, more contemporary literature, so this is Aaron Critch's paper looking at return to sport. This is the kind of stuff that we need to start looking at in this manner. 85% return at eight months, so it's not quite at six months on average, which is probably what a lot of us tell our patients. The people that didn't get back tended to be high school athletes, and they had kinesiophobia as their number one reason for not getting back, so not too surprising. The thing that's interesting is, of the patients that had apprehension on physical exam, those were the ones that really had a negative prognostic indicator that they were going to be able to get back. When they had that apprehension gone on exam, they were usually back to sport. And a TTO decreased the overall strength at six months, so that probably does shut down the quad a little bit more than not doing it. And so we really need to get better at our return to play guidelines with this, just like the ACL, and we'll talk about that a little bit more with our panel. Thank you very much.